So I'm going to start recording the class here. Um, there is uh, an example that is out there on Moodle and it's looking into how you develop uh, a mechanistic curve. Uh, but in this case, how do you calibrate your local data? Uh, this is a rather difficult example, the one I have on the lecture. So instead of that, I'm going to start with something a little simpler. So I'm going to open something very simple here. And uh, we're going to learn our way. So imagine uh, you are calibrating this model. The model is going to have, and I'm just going to open here, uh, maybe a Word document. So we're calibrating. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, can you please repeat the information for the exam, please? Exam is next class, next Monday. Okay, and uh, what will be the duration of the exam? Okay, okay. Um, so I made a pause to answer some questions. Um, uh, we are going to look into how to create a model that we can calibrate the coefficients. So, uh, for instance, uh, I'm looking right now into a specific model. Um, I'm just going to write it here. Or maybe I should write it somewhere else. Okay. So this that I have here on the left that is called open books is one of the most common uh, interfaces uh, used to calibrate models. You can calibrate any type of model and it's free. Um, what we are trying to arrive to is the estimation of the coefficients from an equation. And this is typically something you will do when you know uh, the response, say roughness, cracking, ratting. Okay, and you know the explanatory variables, like the number of isals accumulated, right? Or the environmental region, or uh, the structural number of the pavement. Okay, so you know this. And uh, because you know this, you can have an equation uh, that is called a functional form. And this equation called functional form is simply uh, an equation uh, that use the explanatory variables uh, to estimate the response. But this is not a linear regression like we saw before. This is actually an expression like the ones we use for designing uh, concrete rebars, reinforcement, uh, things like that. So I'm going to start with one simple and then I'm going to move into something more difficult, okay? So I'm, I'm going to start with one that we typically use for road safety. I know this is pavement management, but this is simple uh, so you can understand what I'm doing. So I'm going to start with an example from road safety so you can understand what is on the left and then we take that and we transform it for pavement management. So uh, this one I have now. is uh, the crashes are equals to the ADT, the volume in the road, to the power of a coefficient that I'm calling beta one. And then times 
the exponent. So easy to the power. And then I have beta two times the speed plus beta three times the number of driveways you have per kilometer. So this is what I call a functional form. This is a very simple one. This is why I'm using this as an example, because if I put the one for cracking or ratting, it has equations inside other equations, inside other equations. So it's a little more complicated. So I want to start with something simple so you understand what's happening. The beta one, beta two, and beta three, they are all stochastic nodes. That means they are random, but they have a mean value and they have a standard deviation and they have a 95% confidence interval. And the ADT, the speed and the driveways, these are explanatory variables. Okay. And the response as well. What I call crash is, is the response. Crash is basically the number of predicted crashes, right? Yes, yes, it's the number of predicted crashes. Um, this will be uh, the frequency, or if you want the count of crashes per segment of road. So if you see here the structure of this, anything that goes with the hashtag, uh, the, the symbol in front is a comment. So that is a comment that is not being read. read. Model is the definition of the model and open bracket is uh, for you to start defining the model. For now, let's forget about that portion and let's just concentrate on this portion for a moment. Then it depends on how many observations you have. In this case, I have 34 observations. So this is just a simple loop that I create for the number of observations I have. And then I open a new loop that is uh, defining what is gonna happen for these 34 observations. And the first one is saying that the number of crashes is distributed normally with a mean and a precision. Precision is one over the standard deviation square. I know some of this might be a bit blurry to you. So for instance, imagine you have a mean of, uh, uh, okay, maybe let me just explain the entire thing and then I go back to this. Uh, because we're gonna actually see this in a graph. The next one is defining how the mean, what is the equation behind the mean? And this symbol over here is the same as an equal. And then you have the power of A dt or volume to beta one. Okay, so if I wanna make that exactly to what I have there, I will type volume here. So this is my functional form, the one I have here. Times the exponent, beta two, speed. Now, if you notice, there is a I subscript. This is how a subscript is written. That is because I have multiple points, multiple observations. How many? 34. So that I is this I here. So I am saying I have 34 of these and each of them is gonna have a beta one associated. Then I will look into all the beta ones and I will do a simulation of the beta ones 
and then I will estimate what is the distribution and value of beta one. This one over here, actually, we can ignore. There's no need for this. So, Professor? Yes. Uh, so, after crash, you have uh, normal distribution, mean, and uh, precision. What is the second mean for? Just in the second line, right underneath crash. The second mean. Come in. One second, Cameron. No problem. Because I think I might have deleted a parenthesis. Oh, maybe not. No, I didn't. Um, you have here, uh, okay, so you have- The one under, the one under uh, so, the, so that one, the first one, I, I think it's for the crashes, right? Because we have the crash data. The first one is saying, use. yeah, the first right? one is saying, yes. The first one yes. is saying the crashes are distributed normally. Normally, and it and has a mean follow, and it has a standard precision, and they, right? And they follow a mean mu or mu. Yeah. Okay. And this yep. mean is defined here in, this, in these two lines. Oh, that mean. So that second mean is basically for the function. Yeah, this one here is the definition of this one here. Because okay. this line is only saying it follows a normal distribution okay. with a mean. And if you, pref if you like a standard deviation, but this is not a standard deviation. This is one over this. This is just a precision. Deviation. Yes. It's the yes. same. But, it, okay. but, but when you put the values, you need to write it and it's slightly different. Okay. The Thank next you. part is saying, now, the coefficients that I need to calibrate are called beta one, beta two, and beta three. So forget about the rest and just concentrate on those three coefficients. And it's saying they distribute normally around 1.5 beta one, around 2.1 beta two, and at around 0 0.1 beta three. Now, this is the precision that I was telling you. So you have the mean, and then you have the standard deviation uh, expressed as a precision. So I need pen and paper to do this. Uh, maybe I try in Excel. Let me try on Excel. Imagine uh, this is 1.5, right? So I have a mean equals 1.5, and then I have a precision of 100. So that means that I have 1.5. Uh, I need to draw a shape. Uh, Uh, no, I need to draw a shape. Uh, hmm. Just a second. Let me see if I can. Yeah, this one works. So for this one, for instance, uh, maybe the average will be something like 16.25. That's the mean. Approximately, right? I'm just reading here approximately in the shape. And if 95% of the values arrive all the way to 20, let's say, uh, 20 will be the same as the 97.5% of the values. That means that there is how much between uh, 20 and 16.2? That will be uh, 1.96 standard deviations will be equals to 20 minus 16.25. So uh, my standard deviation will be equals to 375 divided by 196. So my standard deviation is 191. I'm not sure if you guys remember this uh, whenever you took statistics and probability. Uh, of course, uh, 196 standard deviations is for the 95% confidence interval. And you also have the 2.5% here. And in this case, it's gonna be uh, 375 minus this. So it's gonna be 16 minus 375. So it's gonna be 12.5 uh, approximately here, right? So from 12.5, 
220, you have a 95%. This is 95%. Oops, why is not writing? Is that 95% confidence interval or 97.5? Yes. They subtract 97 and a half minus two and a half is 95. So that's my 95% confidence interval. So I have my mean, I have my standard deviation, and I can have my precision if I want. My precision, problem is people typically don't use it, but the precision is one over the standard deviation squared. So in this case, my precision is 0.2. Okay, so the precision is uh, related to how big is the standard deviation. Hmm. What happens if the standard deviation is uh, smaller than that, like 0.1? Then the precision is 100. So if you see here, this is saying that the 95 percentile is from 1.4 to 1.6. That's what this 100 is saying there. Okay. Because our mean value is always between that range. That's why we precision is 100%, right? Because it's always falling in that 95% interval. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, it's uh, standard deviation is 0.1, so two standard deviations will be 0.2. Uh, so this will be 1.2 to almost 1.7. Uh, instead of thinking of 196, you can think of it as uh, two standard deviations. So let me put a couple of figures here. So from your mean, we say 1625, you have two standard deviations to the right. Well, 1.96 standard deviations. Uh, that brings you to 20. And then you have the same, but to the other side. Uh, in this case, it will be 16.25, or I'm gonna write it differently. It's gonna be the mean minus 1.96 standard deviations. Uh, that gives you your 95% confidence interval. So here, your uh, mean is 1.5 and precision is 100. I just changed the value of the standard deviation here to be able to arrive at a precision of 100. So that means the standard deviation is 0 0.1. So uh, 1.96 standard deviations. is 0.196. Uh, so if you want, then you do the 1.5 minus 1.96 and it's moving to uh, 1.5 plus 1.96, okay? So basically, one304 uh, to 196, right? But this is the reason why people don't use, they don't say 196, instead they say two, because it's faster and easier. And so you will just say 195% confidence interval is moving from 1.5 minus two, that's easier, it's just 13, to uh, 15 plus two equals 17. 
Okay, so the accurate value, if you prefer, is this range over here. Uh, but the point is, I am defining the value of this random node or random coefficient, which I don't know what is the value, to be somewhere between these two values. Uh, to be, uh, pardon, to be somewhere between these two values. Hi, um, please, where's the 15 from? Is it 1.5 or 15? Where is 15? No, 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 no. Because I took another example. I don't have an example ready oh, okay. to show you this graph. The graph, we're going to obtain it very soon. I just opened a, a, another chart that I have here for something else. And I show you an example based on 16. Then the example based on 16 I'm using for the 1.5. I'm going to use it now for the 2.1. Let's try to do this one. Sorry, it's not the same. When I run the model, you are going to be able to see beta one, and then we're going to see the actual distribution for that beta one. So let's try to do the second one, beta two. It is 2.1, and then I have 200 as precision. So I just need to, I can solve it actually, but uh, my precision will mean a standard deviation of Point zero seven roughly. Yeah, point zero seven roughly. So I have almost point fourteen here. Okay. So this means that the ninety five percent confidence interval of this goes from two point one minus point fourteen. 2.1 plus 0.14, okay? Is it clear what's happening here? So this is only defining that this node, the this coefficient beta is distributed with a 95% confidence interval between these two values. If I wanna write this one that I have here on the right-hand side, for instance, imagine this is, uh, imagine this is for a coefficient that I call alpha which I don't have right now, but let's imagine that's the case. In that case, I will come here and I will say alpha is normally distributed with 16.25 and, and then I have a standard deviation of 3.75 over 1.96, uh, 1.91, uh, the precision is gonna be 0.2. So I will write here 0.2, oops. So I will write it like that, okay? If I were talking about this that I have here on the right-hand side. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, could you please explain the meaning of precision in this case? Precision is simply defined as uh, is, is a similar to the standard deviation, is how much variability you have around the mean. Because uh, in, in data mining, it means uh, the number of true positives over uh, total number of predictions. No, it doesn't mean that here. This okay. is Bayesian statistics, what we are talking about right now. So the meaning is one, divided over the square of the standard deviation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. So that's why I wrote it here. Precision equals one over the standard deviation square. So, if you wanna be just uh, brief about this, uh, we have the three coefficients like that, right? This one, point 0.1 will be the mean, and then you have that precision associated to it. There is this tau, which is how much variability I have around the mean of each observation.
just a second, guys. I'm I'm looking for something. So you're going to have multiple observations for a specific point, and then we're taking the mean, but we need to know how much is the variability, how much is the uncertainty around, okay? I think I have another example for a bridge. Now it's going to take maybe some time to get to a bridge, but just a second, guys. I have an example here that I can, ah, no, no. No. Hmm. Okay, let me just carry on with this example. This is why I didn't want to start with the most complicated one because uh, you need to understand the little chunks here. Uh, this is for every collision, how much variability on the prediction of that collision there is. And this is just to estimate the uh, standard deviation in case I want. Now, the last bit of the uh, calibration for this uh, stochastic uh, or probabilistic model is a point of departure. So uh, you need to start in different points uh, so that the simulation will run and estimate your coefficients. So I'm going to open here and you will see on the right hand side, I have my data set. For this data set, I have observations of uh, the volume, the speed, the driveways, and the crashes. So these are the variables, the explanatory variables and the response. So I'm using what I have observed from reality in terms of the response and in terms of the explanatory variables, which are read to calibrate the coefficients of the equation. So the calibration goes like this. You go to the model and you say specify the model. You select the model, you highlight it, and you say check model. Yeah, I think I'm missing a parenthesis here. Just give me a second. Sorry, I'm just gonna reopen it because when I was uh, doing that, I delete something. Okay. Uh, so you say model, check model. It's gonna give you here at the bottom uh, indication if the model is correct. We're gonna come here and highlight the data and say load data. It's gonna give you an indication on the bottom left that the data has been loaded. And then the chains are points of departure for the simulation. So typically we use two. In this case, I have two. This is these two strings of values that I call list. So I say two, compile. And now I highlight the first departure point. I go for the second departure point, 
And because I'm trying to predict, uh, then I need to initiate some other values. Now, in the samples, I need a sample for this. That is what values the system is gonna remember that I'm gonna calibrate. So I calibrate beta one, I hit on set. I want beta two. These are the coefficients I want to calibrate. And beta three. And that's all I want. Now I just run the simulation. So the simulation will run here with the update and the model. So I can run, uh, let's say 1000 and refresh every 100 iterations. So it's gonna run, it's running rather fast. So I'm gonna run 10,000. It's running here in the iteration. And I'm gonna run again 10,000. Typically we need to run a, a good number of samples. Uh, 20, 30,000 is like the minimum. Sometimes you need close to a million. In this case, probably 30,000 will be enough. We will see. Okay, and we're all done. Now we can see what is the value of beta one, beta two, beta three, based on this data set. Because these are local observations that they have for the specific phenomena, which is the crash and the explanatory variables. So I can go now and say beta one if I want, and I can see the probability distribution of beta one. See? So this one is saying that my beta one is close to 1.6 maybe in value, not 1.5. I created based on 1.5, but I gave flexibility for the values to fluctuate. Do you remember? I said this value, the 95% confidence interval will be between 1.3 to 1.7, if you recall. I can actually see what is the value. This is my value is 1.557 and this is the actual standard deviation. Now this value is created based on this data set of local conditions. I can do the same for beta two. I can go and see the density of the beta two. Beta two and you see here that this is kind of uh, moving. I'm just gonna zoom in so you can see it. This is because it's a simulation. So it still needs some more iterations to be smooth. But right now it's, uh, it has converged uh, because it's following close to the probabilistic distribution I'm expecting. And the value is probably close to 2.1. So just to understand, uh, Professor. Yeah. Um, so we had the beta one, two, three values from previously observed crashes or other other locations and all that, right? So basically what we are doing is for this particular location, a new location, let's say that we have the observed data for, we are sort of just re-estimating beta one, two, three values or calibrating the values, right? We are but doing a local calibration, are, yes. We are doing local calibrations, but we exactly. had the values. So all those mean values, 1.5, 2.1 are from from a previous observed, exercise, previous uh, exercises, right? Or yes, from from the last one, the closest. Uh, if it is within the same province and you have done a calibration before, you can use those. If it is the first time you do the calibration in this in the country, then you use the values they have obtained in other countries. And if you know nothing about those values, you establish the values uh, uh, in a way that. Uh, uh, you put a zero here. Okay. And then you put this to be almost minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay. So get the new values, basically the new values, right? Uh, yes. Uh, but if you don't know the values, you can still say they have no contribution. So the value is zero, the mean. And this, instead of being 200, because 200 is going to give me something small. I want that to be uh, uh, maybe 0 0.00 something. So let me try here. Um, so uh, let's say I want a large standard deviation. You see the precision goes down to 0 0.001, right? Yes, yes. 
So I will have here something like 0 0.001. Okay. And this one means I don't know that value, but the system needs to go and estimate. Now it's gonna be more difficult for the system to estimate. I can rerun it so you can see it. I'm just repeating the same. It's, it's a three step model, data, and then the chains. And then I need to go and define the samples again. So in this case, I'm, I'm only interested in beta uh, two, uh, but anyways, let me put beta one, beta two, beta three. And I need to update the model now, but it's gonna take longer for convergence. In the meantime, ask me questions because I'm running 100,000 times. Um, so the number of observations, is it based on the local data? The yes. One? Okay, all right. So for your local data, you will have observations of the AADT or ESALs. So maybe you have the ESALs, the amount of RI, and the structural number of the pavement. And based on that, you have that for a specific homogeneous group. And then you bring that information here, just like we did for volume and speed uh, and crashes. So instead of crashes, you have RRI. Instead of volume, you have ESALs. Instead of speed, you have the environmental region. Instead of driveways, you have the structural number of the pavement. You put it there and you run. Okay, all right. That means that we need to get um, similar values for beta, beta one, beta two for a project done in our like, location, right? Close to yes, I'm gonna show you one for pavement management in a moment. The problem is that this is the simplest thing because the, the, the system is not only able to, to calibrate, it's also able to calibrate when you actually don't know anything about that. Okay. And it's also able to handle uh, missing data. So if but some values, you don't have volume, then we can create a stochastic node that will use the average of the rest with the standard deviation of the rest so that you don't lose the string of values. And this system is also able to handle multiple groups at the same time. So you can define groups and it can give you a coefficient per group because this is, this is right now for one homogeneous group. Okay. Right, but you can have multiple homogeneous groups. Uh, okay. I, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I think it might have converged. Let me see. Yeah, it converged. You see Camran, beta two? But I ran a hundred thousand yeah. times to accomplish conversions. Okay. But this is when you don't know anything about the value. And I could have done the, the, the same with the rest, but then it's a very heavy model. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah, uh, can I ask you about the chains? We have values for beta one and beta two and beta three. Uh, we have two chains. From where did we get this data? Like beta one is 1.1, beta two is 2.3. Well, do you say you have an average of 1.5 and you are saying, I'm hoping, and I know because of past experience, the value is between 1.3 and 1.7. Now I need a departure value. I could have used 1.3 as departure value, but I want to be more drastic and allow for non-convergence, allow for something that is going to start far away. So I put 1.1. Let me put the trace. Okay. Hold on, hold on. Let me put the trace. Okay. And, um, let me put the trace uh, maybe up to 200 uh, for beta one. Uh, no, it's not giving me the trace. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, here. So this is my beta one. I am starting in very different points. I'm starting in 1.1 and 1.7. If you see here, the values, 1.1, 1.7, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And what I want to test is if the simulation will converge, will move into a common value. You see how they're getting close and close and close? If yeah. I actually close this and I show you the entire thing, 
well, maybe 10,000. You see how they, they start at very far away points, but then they get together and they move together very close. So you have mm -hmm. converged in your simulation. Otherwise, if you get something like this, I'm gonna do something that is not correct, but if you get something like this, they have not converged because they are not moving together. So what I do here, uh, Jawad, is mm -hmm. I use far away values. The same for the second one. I know the second one is like 2.1. So I put values that are a little away. They're trying okay. to, to force that convergence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, doctor, but uh, for uh, beta two, we said that if we don't know anything and we don't have experience, uh, let's write it zero and the precision we, we, we have write it like uh, point zero zero one. But still we have uh, in the chains uh, uh, values for beta two, which you is two point three. You need to a point. You have no choice. Okay, so how can we expect this started point uh, if we don't have any experience in this uh, values? Do you know is positive the coefficient or is negative? A coefficient that is positive, we have an inverse uh, impact. So you go back to your equation, this one, and then mm -hmm. you have your beta two, right? Do you expect yeah. the speed to contribute more speed to less collisions? If that is the case, beta two could take on negative values. If more speed is more collisions, then beta two can only take on positive values. That's the first yeah. thing you need to ask yourself. Mm -hmm. The second one is, uh, I need a starting point. So I could have right zero and 10 if I want, or I can write a hundred and zero, but this is because I know it's positive. Now, if I know it's maybe not positive, I can write minus 10 and 10. It depends, it's up to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's your starting point. Doesn't mean that that is the value. If yeah. I show yeah. you beta two, You see, at the beginning, it was not moving together because it was having a hard time reaching convergence, but then it, yeah. it did get together. So, yeah. Professor, yes. um, so in this case, I mean, we are looking at this uh, um, form of equation, which is nonlinear. Uh, is it possible that if we have a linear function and we have some coefficients and we try to estimate calibrate coefficient through this process? Oh, yes, Is yes, that applicable yes. to linear also? Oh, yes, yes, you just remove here okay. the power. I'm gonna show you, let me, maybe okay. I switch gears and I show you a different example, okay? okay? Is it the overall idea, not the, I know you can probably not code it right now, but is the overall idea clear? So I can open a different model, a little uh, different? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm gonna open a different model. I don't know how complicated is this. Uh, maybe this one I keep for later. Uh, cracking or rotting? What do you prefer? Rotting. Yes, rotting. Okay. Just give me a minute because I need to open the data set. Just a second, guys, please. Um, this is the same equations we saw before uh, two lectures ago. So I'm just gonna put the same presentation so we can see where the questions are.
Okay. Do you remember this? This is the form that we saw before. Now, if you notice here, I have K1I is this K1 here. Uh, times a coefficient. Um, I think this coefficient I have here is going to be my EV estimated from elsewhere. And then I have, ah, no, pardon, that 0 0.00356 is 10 to the power of this. If you, if you try it, you will see, is this value. Is this 10 to the power of this? That's, that's this one that I have here. And then I have T1 to the power of alpha. So it's T to the power of alpha. But you see this 1.56, I'm calling that alpha instead. And then I have n to the power of 0 0.4792. And I have n to the power of beta. This 0 0.4792 was estimated with a software like this. Okay, so what we're doing is we're learning how to estimate these coefficients. Or calibrate with local information. And then I have the strain ACI which is coming from this value, EV here, sorry. Uh, because I have EP, right? We're clear on that? So this EV goes on the other side and multiplies. And then that E value is multiplied by the thickness, H. So that's why I have my H here. Okay? Now, problem is this has multiple equations. So K1, I need to write the equation for that, which is this one over here. If you remember, this is my K1 over here. So it's C1 plus C2 times the depth plus 0.328196 uh, to the power of the depth. So that's what I have here. I have my um, C1 Ah, sorry guys, it's because C1 itself is developed as this as 0.1039 H AC squared. So that's the one you have here. So this this whole thing here is your C1 here, okay? That's why I didn't want to open this one first and I prefer to open the most simple example. The C2 here is this one here. Okay? Or like this if you prefer. Okay, that is my C2. And then I still need to define my strain, which I'm defining with an equation here, which I'm not gonna explain, I'm taking four because otherwise, um, it's gonna be a bit confusing to you, but it has elastic modulus and has other stuff inside. Now, my alpha, which is this alpha, is the one on the power of t, is 1.56. You see here, my t. So that's why I define here 1.56. My beta, 0.479244, is the same I have here. So I'm starting, as Cameron uh, correctly stated, with the values that I know, but I want to calibrate to local conditions. 
what are my local conditions? My local conditions are uh, this information I have here. Okay. Those are my local conditions. So I will go to my model. Oh, pardon. And I have 112 values. I am defining ratting as a function of, and this is the average. And this is my value for the average, all this. Why? Because K1 is defined here. And putting all this expression here will complicate things. So this software actually allows you to have one expression and then define that expression below. So you can break the expressions in chunks. Um, hi, um, just yes. a quick one. So given that these equations are standard equations, right? So if we get this particular coding and we have like, say a project somewhere, we can just take this coding and calibrate it to the local conditions, right? So is it possible for you to share this code with us? Yeah, sure. Okay, All right. thank you. Sure. So let's run it and let's see what happened. I'm gonna specify my model. I specify the data. Doctor, sorry, but yes. for the question, but uh, MW or mu, is it the average or is it the plastic strain? It's the mean. It's always the, the mean, mean value. Yeah. You can type mean if you prefer. Yeah, because the equation uh, underneath is uh, the same as the plastic. Yeah, what? E. Jawat. The, the, right? uh, yeah. So we call it Jawat. <laughs> okay. Model. Check model. It doesn't matter. Ah, it's going to give me a problem here because I call this Jawat. Uh, it doesn't matter. You can call it whatever you want. Okay. You just need to be consistent when you are using it. Mm -hmm. Ah, I was saying I have only one, no, I have two chains. The chains define alpha and beta, and tau is the variability around the mean for the prediction, not for the coefficients. Remember you have uncertainty on the coefficient alone, and you have uncertainty around the uh, forecast value of ratting. So uh, I'm gonna have two chains. And now I'm just gonna go and infer my values. So the values I wanna infer are alpha and beta. Remember, alpha and beta are these two values, the 1.56, okay? And the 0.4792. Those two values are the values I'm inferring from my local data, this one. So I have alpha and beta, and I just run the simulation. This is, uh, I don't wanna scare you, it's, it's a complicated simulation, so we're not gonna go into the details of what is behind scenes. Um, okay, so let's go for 10,000. Good. And maybe I run uh, 30,000. I think that should be enough. Now what the system is gonna do is gonna tell me whether for that local data set, I use 1.56 for the temperature and 0.479244 for the uh, load, uh, for the cumulative uh, ESALs 
or whatever load that produced this strain. So system is over. Uh, hopefully has converged, I don't know, so let's see, yeah. So uh, let's look at the other one. Actually, we don't need to type one by one, we can just type asterisk and get the densities. Good, and we can get the values. So I have 1.553 and 0 0.4955. So if I go back to my lecture, I wouldn't use now 15606, I will use 1553 for this specific location, this specific roads, and 0.4955 instead of 0.479244. So that's my local calibration. Any questions so far here? Okay. I'm um, gonna close this one and I'm gonna open the cracking. So, Professor? Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, question. Yeah. Um, just, as a, just as a scenario, just as a scenario. Uh -huh. I'm just trying to see if uh, it makes sense or if I'm uh, getting it uh, right. So let's say if I have a scenario somewhere, um, I have some data, observed data and stuff, and I first I develop a linear regression model and I get my coefficients. You know, the y is equal to a1 x1 plus a2 x2 form, right? Yeah. And let's say if I want to use the same function and I have a different location, and can I recalibrate those coefficients that I calculated with linear regression in here using this one? Yeah, yeah, of course. You can put Make an sense, expression. Right? If you can okay. put this complicated expression, you can put any expression you want. Okay, but it's, it's applicable, right? I mean, so... Yeah, even, yeah, yeah. yeah? You, okay. you, say, you say like this. Uh, uh, you will say beta 1 times x1. Yeah. So my point was that, uh, I mean, it, it, theoretically it makes sense, right? That if I do, I come up with my coefficient, the initial first coefficient, so linear regression model, and then I can just keep calibrating them using this Bayesian update, right? This is Bayesian update that we are doing or? It's full Bayesian. So the full Bayesian, right? Full Bayesian, okay. Marco Shane Monte Carlo. It's using Gibbs sampler, yes. So all, all those three, Monte Carlo and Markovin is uh, part of this. I mean, this is like a full Bayesian includes Markovian uh, updates and uh, Monte Carlo simulation because it's generating random numbers, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. But you know this can run that when you do a linear regression, yes. you are just trying to see how big is the correlation between yes. one variable and the response. That is not exactly. explaining the exact contribution of that response. When we create the mechanistic equations is because uh, we have sufficient experience yes. uh, to know uh, the participation of that, for instance. Let me just close this one. Uh, if I want to put the, mark, uh, the uh, roughness, uh, I have it here. See, I have here my ESALs. Uh, divided by um, the structural number coefficient to the power of five. So this type of uh, relationships, uh, they are they are created by experiments, but but also they are created by theory uh, that explains. Okay. Uh, see, because it's not linear right now, and um, yes. Yeah. This is actually saying the structural number uh, in deterioration, the higher this value, the lower this ratio. This is a fraction, right? So the yes. higher the structural number, the stronger the pavement. And then dividing the, the, the load, which is on the numerator, which is ESALS, yes. is like a demand to capacity kind of expression, what I have here now. Yes. It's also a structural number. Uh, so the higher the structural number, the less deterioration. Yes. For the same number of ESALs, right? The lower this, the higher the deterioration. So, 
uh, yes, you can use linear regression, but if you have an expression that captures the casualty phenomena, then use yep. that expression. If you don't have an expression, then go for your linear regression or okay. whichever is the best fit you can, you can have, right? Of course. Yeah, 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 even a non-linear, I mean, you know, logarithmic or something, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I want to open one last one. Um, I think, well, maybe we can use this one that I had it open already. And let me open the data for this. You see, we have this uh, Z value. This is the group. We have homogeneous group, homogeneous group three, homogeneous group three, homogeneous group one, homogeneous group one, homogeneous group two, homogeneous group three, homogeneous group two. So this Z is homogeneous group. So uh, here, I'm saying, uh, the S is three homogeneous groups for this coefficient and three homogeneous groups for this coefficient. And for some reason, I only use two for this one. I cannot recall right now, guys, to be honest. Uh, but you can have the homogeneous groups inserted in there. So what happens is uh, you have uh, one coefficient inside the other one. So um, don't worry too much. I'm just gonna run it so you, you understand what is happening uh, when I specify this. I have two chains. You can have more than two, but uh, two is the minimum. And we take samples. So my samples are for my coefficients, A1, A2, A3. This is the structural number coefficients, right? Do you remember the structural number? Hopefully I talk about the structural number in another class. I don't think I did in this class. Uh, did I? Yeah, coefficient A1, A2, A3. Yeah, okay, so you guys remember the, the structural number, right? The A1, A2, A3. I don't have it there. But that's what I'm trying to get here. A1, A2, A3. Oh, you see how slow this is updating because this is a heavy model. It probably has a good thousand or two thousand. It has one thousand five hundred observations. That's why it's slow. So I'm just gonna update there, and in the meantime, then I'm gonna uh, bring from here. Um, so, professor. Yeah. Um, you said it's a full Bayesian update. Uh, so what are the other like partial Bayesian updates or how? No, Bayesian you have, a, yeah, because you have, a, you have the Bayesian, simple Bayesian, which is one step. Uh, it's okay. prime, uh, times likelihood equals posterior, one time. Uh, that's just a simple Bayesian. But the full Bayesian is you repeat the procedure uh, thousands of times. Okay. Those are the 1,000 I'm running here. Well, so far 2,000. Let me see if okay. I can do the 10,000. In the meantime, I just recall here uh, from this one. And uh, let me see, that should be in the class where I talk about the ESALs. Um, and it's, basically, it's basically generating random numbers and within those, defined parameters and sort of rerunning them, rerunning them, and then uh, sort of coming up with that uh, converged uh, values for the coefficients, right? 
That's what yes I'm and no. Yes, yes and but no. you okay. are missing one element. You okay. are correct, Ran, uh, You are correct, uh, Cameron, but you are missing one element. Okay. The response. The response Rating, okay. collisions, and in this case is okay. RI. So in this okay. case is the differential in RI. Okay. And in this case, when it's running, is trying to uh, get close to that differential. I don't okay. know if you see what I'm saying. It's like a genetic algorithm. So it's, it's initially the first genetic one algorithm. is random. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But then identifies in what direction needs to move so that the multiplication in this expression yeah. and, the multiplica and, and this expression, this value gets yeah. close to this value as much as possible. This is predicted. This is observed. So it's trying okay. to close the gap between those close two. Close the gap. Okay. Yeah, it's like uh, the next, in the genetic algorithm, the next generation, uh, or next solution should be better than the previous one, right? So you get close and close and close. Exactly. So I just ran 10,000 because it takes some time, but you can see I'm getting decent values. It still is a bit shaky because I need to run a few more thousand iterations probably, but I have A11 and A12. This is the uh, top layer. That's what I was trying to show you here. Is this a structural number? And we know the values are between 0.2 and 0.44 for A1, okay? Uh, so in here is getting 0.3, well, we can see the values actually. 0.3283 and 0.3297, they're very close actually. This is because the information has been broken in two groups, yes? I can, have my A2, for instance, and I can see my density for A2. I have three groups, and I can see the actual statistics for the groups. So it's 0 0.19, 0 0.20, and I can see the same for the A3. Uh, so the A3 is coming very low, as a matter of fact. Uh, 0 0.10, 0 0.09, 0 0.10. You see the, point, the A3 is somewhere between 0 0.06 and 0 0.16. So we're getting that local calibration for these values. Do you recognize the form I'm using? I'm just using the Patterson form, where I have the difference in RI is the RI equals RI zero. So I'm just subtracting and I have the rest of the equation as we had before. And then the structural number is being uh, replaced by the expression from the World Bank. So I'm using this expression here. I'm using this expression on the right hand side. Is there any question on this, guys? This is the tool to calibrate, okay? I will just open one last one quickly. And this is when you have missing data. Um, Oh, this has two particularities as a matter of fact. Uh, you can see here exponential m1 to the h beta plus alpha times the accumulated isals divided by the power, but we don't have the structural number. We have replaced the structural number by a different expression, the area from the deflectometer. Do you see what I'm doing, guys? This one is my Patterson model. So let me open the Patterson again. Yeah. 
This one is this, right? But instead of using a structural number coefficient, I'm using area from deflections. So this is also something you can do. Sometimes you, you don't have the exact variable, but you have a proxy. You have something close to the variable that you need to use. In that case, you can replace it with something similar. And then you need to calibrate. So in this case, I decided to calibrate alpha and beta and respect the power of five that is already here in the equation. Can you see it here? Of course, uh, I make the division here on the equation, they're making a multiplication. It's exactly the same. That's one particularity, the use of a proxy, but there's another one. Do you see I have 3000 observations? But it turned out that in this area value, I don't have values for everybody. I am missing 482 values. And so what I'm doing is I'm creating a stochastic node that is imputating. That means it is synthetically generating 482 values that are using the same average and the same standard deviation. Well, it's, it's, it's actually precision, but that are distributed based on the other values I do have. Are you following what I'm saying? Typically, when you have a long data set and in your data set you are missing values, you simply remove them. Do you see this NA? That means I don't have the value for this. And maybe zoom. Let me try to let me try to increase the font. For this first row of information, the uh, environmental region is 0 0.07. The roughness I observe is 139. The age of the pavement is one year. The uh, uh, accumulated ESALs is 578,372. It's expressing millions. It is from traffic intensity one, environmental region one is group one, but I don't know the strength of the pavement. Typically, you will remove this, but you are losing information because then you have to remove all this. Instead of removing, this software allows for the uh, for district. So it's taking this and it's making a random distribution that will not bias the results. The results will not be biased. Okay, uh, I'm going a little beyond the purpose of this class. Uh, but it's important so you understand the reason why I'm showing you this software. Two reasons, it's very powerful and it's free. Uh, if there's no questions, I will close it. And, I have uh, a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, why did you choose 482? Count them. For P, P in one to 482? You count them, you go down and you count here. Okay and mm -hmm. you will count 482 NAs. See, I have values now. Mm -hmm. But if you count the ones before, mm -hmm. up to here, you will count 482. It's not possible to count, is it? It, uh, it, it is, Excel. but it's time consuming. No, you have it in Excel, you have it in Excel. Okay, okay. And in Excel, got it, got it. in Excel you have NA, mm -hmm. one, two, three, NA, one, two, three, N, A, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. then you just put an if condition and you say if this value is uh, equals to N, A, then give me zero or give me one, otherwise give me zero. Or just apply a filter. Yeah, you apply a filter, you bring it mm -hmm. down and then you count, you make a summation, right? And you know you have three with an ace. You do the same with this. This is coming from Excel as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. So if you want to export information from Excel, that's probably something important for some of you who might be wondering how to handle this. Uh, you need to 
put the same name of variable, it cannot be different. If it is different, then you have to correct it later on. And you have to put these square brackets with nothing inside. You put all the information and at the end, you have to add end. So you come to Excel, you select the entire data set, you go to a notepad, You dump it in notepad. You go to the last row. Sorry, you cannot see my last row, right? Yeah, there. You go to the last row and you say end. And you save it as, who was asking? I was asking. Like this? close it, then you come to the software, you say file, open, text, you were asking, and it's here ready for you to use. Okay? Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions regarding this software, guys? And this is applicable for anything, not only pavement management, right? As I show you, it's applicable for safety, it's applicable for uh, flow distribution, it's applicable for pipes, it's applicable for any system that you need to calibrate and you have equations and observations, okay? And for any, any distribution, right? I mean, we have been using normal distribution. Oh, yes, yes, there are more than distribution. That. Yeah, yeah, there are distributions. You have the manuals here. And you actually can do this uh, with a spatial information if you want with this one. And you have the distributions here. Bernoulli, binomial, negative binomial, Poisson, geometric, okay? Okay. We're using Thank normal you. in this case, yes, because we're trying to simplify, but uh, you can have any other distribution. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna close here and um, yes. Um, I have skipped this one. What to do when you have two condition data points, okay? Uh, this is so that we can cover the material for today. If you need it for your term paper or project, let me know. Just a second, guys, this is on the middle of the way. <clears throat> okay, so um, we're gonna try to learn how to uh, observe the effectiveness of a treatment. Uh, so uh, we're gonna see how, oh, this is going by itself. We're gonna see what is the effectiveness of a treatment. Uh, sometimes we call it treatment, intervention, um, action, Remedial work. Countermeasure. Okay, it has multiple names. We're gonna see how do we estimate how effective these are. Now, the first thing you need to know is that when a uh, pavement is deteriorating and at some moment on time you apply an intervention, the pavement is gonna gain additional life. So from this moment up, this is the moment at which you apply your intervention. If you have not applied the intervention, the pavement will have continued deteriorating. This uncertainty that you see here is the uncertainty around the mean. The mean value is this solid line that we saw before, and this is the deterioration curve that you have estimated. 
because you have that deterioration curve, you know how many years will have been the life of this pavement. But because you apply this, then that means that now the pavement has gained condition up to here and will deteriorate through this line over here. At this moment here, on year 14, the pavement will have arrived to the same level of condition that it had on year maybe four or maybe three. So that means that you have a lifespan extension. Uh, no, this line doesn't wanna help me out. But uh, this is one of the two things you can uh, get out of the effectiveness is an extension on the number of years that the asset will serve. You have here this jump. So if this is the pavement condition index, and this is 100, and this is 70, and if you apply, uh, no, pardon, this is not 100, this is something like 80. Uh, yeah, the figure, mm, the figure has a little issue. It cannot go beyond this point, right? Because this is the maximum point. But the point is you have this jump in condition. This is called the improvement. And this is called the extension on service life. So these are two important concepts. The other one is how fast this is gonna deteriorate after you apply the treatment. Is it gonna deteriorate faster or slower? Let me see, I think I have I have an Excel that I can probably open to show you this. Excuse me. Yes. Is this a prediction or it's a real observation? No, no, no. The, the graph that I'm showing is conceptual. Okay. This is not, there's no real information. That's probably why it has that mistake. Um, okay. Effectiveness. Here. Okay. So you have some observations of roughness. Uh, well, this is corrosion, but imagine it's roughness. Okay. The blue ones is what you have observed. Sorry, guys, this is for a bridge. So this will be corrosion of the bridge in percentage. So is the blue one. You can get a best fit model. The best fit model will forecast how fast. Now you get to the year, uh, let's say 99. And after that, that's the year where you are now. And you decide to do something to this uh, uh, bridge. You can think of a pavement. For now, let's stick to the bridge. So you go, you uh, replace the elements that are heavily corroded, otherwise you remove the corrosion and paint it. Because you remove elements, now you go as the black line. The system goes almost black back to new because you remove every single element that is corroded, right? All the elements of the bridge that are corroded are gone. But in addition to that, you paint it anti-corrosion paint on the bridge. So the rate that you had here is not the same as the rate you have in the black dots. This rate is much slower than this rate over here. The orange is what will have happened if you don't apply the treatment, the intervention. The black is what actually happens. So you have then This gain, which we can actually measure, this was 22.6. So you gain 22.6 drop back to zero. 
because all the elements are new now. And the rate of deterioration, which was 2.583, uh, that was the rate, that rate changes. And now you have a much slower rate. You can see we can get a regression here again. So my rate is now 0.54. So I gain this, I reduce the rate, and how much did I extend the life of this system? Well, we will have to extend this line until the line reach the same height as here. So I don't have that for this one. Uh, we will have to read it here, but it's when you reach the same level of condition that you had before. Problem is, we have some uncertainty associated to this. So imagine instead of that, that we have 10 bridges. So imagine we have uh, how many? Four bridges, okay? And we are observing the amount of corrosion. All the bridges are in the same region, environmental region. All of them are used by the same uh, type of uh, metallic steel, all the same type of bridge, maybe with a superstructure and a concrete deck. All that are the same characteristics. And we go and we observe them. And when we observe them, we observe this. So out of this, you can create a performance model. You probably agree with me. This is like roughness or cracking or rotting. It's exactly the same. But I don't have an example right now that I can open for you. Uh, but it's exactly the same. So you can uh, put all the bridges. One, one important piece of information is uh, right now in this table, I have them like this, but to be able to uh, get a best fit, you have to put one bridge below the other one. So this one over here is the same as this bridge over here. But this one over here is the same as this. You see, one five, two five, five one. So I put one bridge below the other one. If you don't believe me, the bridges will continue there. And you can get your best fit. Doctor? It's time. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, what if, what, uh, what if we make uh, each bridge uh, individually, like maintenance uh, for each bridge individually, not, not separately, sorry. That's fine, but how do you go about a pavement network where you have 30,000 segments of pavements? You do 30,000 performance curves? Yeah, uh, no, no, the pavement, I think it's a, another scenario, but I'm, I'm asking for the bridge. Can we make it for bridge, uh, each bridge separately? Yes, you can. And for the pavement But for as well. the pavement, we have a lot of data, yeah? So that we, we can't do it. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. for the bridges, you have 200 bridges. It depends where you are. If the country is very dry, you might have 10. And then you have one performance curve for one. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you, yeah, sure. Uh, this will allow me to kind of see visually here the variability. The dot line the 1.1481 x to the power of that with a 97 uh, R squared is the mean expectation. And this is my deterioration curve, right? Now, no effectiveness so far, but I need this. I need this because this is telling me this over here is really my time in years. 
And this one over here is really my corrosion percentage. So I have a way to correlate time with the indicator that I want. That's why the performance curve is important. Now, I have my time, I have my corrosion. I'm using this equation, you see here? This is the same as this equation over here. So what I'm doing is I am forecasting what it is, the average, yes? But I can do something else. I can also take the 95% uh, around this. Now, for the effectiveness, we're going to use something that we call uh, performance metrics. So this corrosion is the same as age equals to one. This corrosion, 292, is the same as age equals two. This corrosion, 5%, 5.04%, is the same as age equals three. So these values of corrosion are the same as these apparent ages. I'm just using the performance curve. You can come back and check if you want. The value here in three is close to five, right? The value in three is close to five. The value here in seven is close to 15. The value in seven is close to 15, right? The value in five is 10. The value in five is 10. I'm just using this equation. But I'm using this equation to have apparent ages, apparent age, and the indicator. So I'm gonna take those and I'm gonna say age, this one, and corrosion, this one. That's how I get these two columns. Are we clear so far? It's a simple yeah. relationship between uh, every time step in years and the amount of damage that I have. Of course, I have a range associated to it. And these same values I have here are the same values I have here. Zero to 1.15, zero to 1.15 is the equivalent to H1. So this is reading age in that direction. While this one is reading age down. Now, this is a matrix. It's like a table. And so, it's gonna help me to estimate the effectiveness of the treatment. Why? Because, if I have observations of before and after, and let's imagine I have in my observations of before and after, I had before and I have after. So I know in the before, oops, let me just push this down. Imagine in the before, I know it was at 5.52 uh, and the after was um, 8.56. And then in the before I have, um, well, let's work out this one. 
What is 5.52 in DB4? 5.52 is here in this range, right? So this is my before range. And what is my after range? My after range is whatever corresponds here. So this is before. And why is corrosion increasing? Why is corrosion increasing in the after? I did it on purpose. It should, I did it on purpose. Down. Yeah, yeah, it should go okay. down, but okay. I did it on purpose. Just okay. a second, camera. All right. Okay, okay. Because this can serve for two purposes. So I want to explain the other purpose before I, I jump see. into the explanation here. So from 552, which is here, it goes to 856, which is here. So I have one. So what happened if I have in the before 552 and in the after 552? And this is called Lewis and this is called Cameron. The segment called Lewis will be here and the segment called Cameron will be here. Sorry, Cameron, I misspelled your name. Lewis has not changed condition. It's the same condition, it's the same age. Cameron has deteriorated one year because he moved from four to five. Before at four, after at five. This is a deterioration, what I'm capturing now. Now imagine we have other segment that at the beginning is on um, 7.96 and after is on 1.25. So uh, this segment is gonna be, who is there? I think, um, yeah. Fouad, thank you. Fouad has volunteer. Did I misspell your name? Yes, it's okay. Okay, thank you. So before is at 796, so it's here. Where is after? It's at 125, so it's here. So Fouad is here. This is his Fouad before. And this is Fouad after, if you prefer. So that means that he has moved from there to here. This is capturing an improvement. Do you guys agree with me? Yeah. What happened when I'm moving on the main diagonal? The main diagonal is no change. So when I have something like this, I only care about the uh, the elements that are to the left of the main diagonal, moving to the left. So when I have a data set, you need to separate the deterioration from the improvement. Because typically when you open your data set, it's gonna be a mix up. In some cases, you will observe improvement. In other cases, you will observe deterioration. So you need to separate and create a new database where you only have deterioration. So I'm gonna remove this from now. Remove this. 
And now, this is what I'm gonna do. Excuse me, I'm gonna have, let's say instead of after that, I'm gonna have, let's say it's this much. So let's imagine we have those values. Okay. From 552 to 125. That will be here, one value, right? Now I go to the next one. From 565 to 2.5. Is it still moving from here? Ah, to here. So I have two now in my count. And now I have from 5.7 to 2.8. Is it still here? So I have three observations. Okay, let me do something different here. The last one from 5.9 is still here, but moving back only one here, so it will be one. Okay, so imagine we have this now, and this is my before and after observations. Out of four segments, three have gained how many extra years on life? When I jump one, I'm jumping from four to three. When I jump two times, I'm jumping from four to two. So they have gained two additional years of life. <clears throat> and one segment has gained only one year of life, additional, extra service life. This is the effectiveness of my treatment. The effectiveness of my treatment is based on how many uh, extra years of extension on life I have gained. So three out of four is a 75% of the segments and 25% of the segments. So 75% of the segments have gained two years and 25% of the segments have gained one year. So you get a weighted average. Of course, this is a very conceptual example, right? All this information is fake but it's, it's only for you to see. So on average, the effectiveness is 1.75 years <clears throat> uh, lifespan extension. This is called a transition probability matrix. And this transition probability matrix, as I said, could be used for the two cases. It can be used for deterioration, or it can be used for improvement. Questions so far? You're probably wondering where this is coming from. I have some other data down there. So we will see in a moment. Uh, uh, sorry, Professor. Yes. Uh, the term before and after is uh, related uh, to the uh, cohesion or, uh, or maintenance or- uh, Exactly. Something. Yes. Yes, uh, exactly. To the, to the, to the, co to the co cohesion? It's before maintenance and rehabilitation. And this is uh, after before, uh, this is rehabilitation. Uh, before rehabilitation. Yes, and after. Thank, thank you. Thank yes. Now look at this one over here. How many years have they gained? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Up to eight, right? From, because here is nothing. 
Here is one year, two, three, four, five. So five as a minimum. So let's do the math again, but for that over there. And you will see the reason why I'm doing two of them. So we have uh, one, three, five, and two. So we have this out of that. It's a 9%. And uh, this one has gain. I'm going to count again. One, two, three, four, five. So this one has gained five years. That's the gain in years, this is the percentage, and this is the count. Uh, this one has gained six years, seven years, eight years, right? Are we all clear? That's why we're creating the metrics like this. Every time I move one cell is one year. How do I know that is one year? Because I calibrated with this equation that is correlating years with the indicator. So I am using exact number of years here, one, two, three, four, five, six, to get the value that corresponds to that. That's why I have here a one. And if you go here, you see I'm using the same equation to see what is the amount of damage for one year. The same for the two. I'm using the same equation to see how much is for two years. So the deterioration curve is used to calibrate the treatment effectiveness mechanism. Now, going back to the example then, from here, this value is the same as this, so that means no change, no improvement. This means one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, six, seven, and eight. Five, six, seven, and eight percentages. And then I get a weighted average, so I'm just gonna multiply this. So 6.77 is the uh, number of years of lifespan extension. What treatment is more effective? The first one with 1.75 or the other one with 6.72? That one is more effective, right? The second one is. Sometimes when you are doing this, you have a large data set. I don't know if I have one here. Let me see. Maybe I do. I have PCI 2010. Sorry guys, it's because it was on, couldn't do. I have PCI 2010, PCI 2009, right? When I make the difference between this, I know if it is improving or deteriorating, right? This one, for instance, moved from 41 to 86. So I know it's an improvement, right? Yeah. But this one moved from 100 to 86, so it's deteriorating. Yeah. This one moves from 90 to 86, it's deteriorating. This one moved from 53 to 86, so it's an improvement. Because this is the year after and this is the year before. But do you see here that I know this was crack sealing or this was microsurfacing? Or, uh, sorry, I just misspelled. It doesn't say. Do you realize of that? It's not telling me. Or this is a reconstruction. 
I don't know for anybody. I have no clue what's going on. Do you agree with me? Yes. Here, I'm not telling you what type of maintenance is happening, but you will expect that the effectiveness of the maintenance up here, because it's one year old asset, or two year or three year, will be little. But as you get to lower stages where the asset is eight, nine years old, you are expecting a more effective treatments, which actually we are observing. So there are, as a matter of fact, uh, when you do this, you will realize that typically you have uh, something like this. Uh, because this is only less than two year life extension. So this is probably a crack ceiling. You went down there, you seal the cracks, that make you gain maybe one, maybe two years max. But in this other case over here, you are gaining on average 6.72 years. So maybe this is a meal and overlay. We don't know for sure. But is following what we expect as a trend. What does it tell you this range over here? That range tells you how much variability you have in your contractors. Right? What happened if you have, instead of two, five, three, one, okay? Instead of that, you have, uh, these are how many, 11? Yeah, 11. What happened if you have six there, five there? Then it's more tight, right? All contractors have closer quality. What happened if you have one, uh, three, five, four, Actually, let's put four, two, one, one. It's all over the place, right? This is not good. This is telling you something in, in the quality of the interventions. It's also telling you something Excuse else. Me. Yes. Is it possible that the numbers uh, are related to the type of uh, maintenance or rehabilitation instead yeah. of uh, different contractors? Uh, but they all started at the same level of deterioration, somewhere between 1892 and 22.16. For example, for one segment, they, they would do um, Milan overlay, and for uh, the other segment, they, they would do uh, micro ceiling. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how do you say your name? Mayar? Mayar? Mayar. Mayar. You are absolutely yeah. correct. This also could signify that somebody uh, made a mistake and scheduled a treatment that the effectiveness is very limited. This one over here could be a crack ceiling that has a very limited effectiveness. Mm -hmm. While this one over here could be a partial reconstruction because it brought it back to new. And this one over here could be Milan overlay. Ideally, we would like to know what was done. So ideally, mm -hmm. we would not like to know this is crack ceiling. Uh, no, pardon, this is deteriorating. Sorry guys, let me just put the deterioration. Even if we have uh, enough of observation, we could predict uh, what, what was really done in that situation. You don't know for sure, but you have a good idea. Mm -hmm. Because in some cases you see uh, from 2009, 
to 2010, the increase is small. You see, 85 to yeah. 87 or 88? 84 to 87, 88. 82 remained the same, didn't change. But now look at this, from 30 to 84, 85, 75. Mm -hmm. So it's a much bigger jump in terms of effectiveness. So when we are doing this, it's uh, often advisable that you kind of uh, break uh, in the ranges that you know is reasonable to do something. So here, right? Uh, for this range, maybe it's reasonable to do a specific type of intervention. While after this point is not reasonable and you have to do something else. And in this other range, you have to do the full replacement or full reconstruction. Of course, just one second, sorry, just give me 10 seconds. Sure. I just need to clarify, this is only for nine years. This typically goes on and on, right? Up to 2025 or more. But I wouldn't be able to show you the example and, and do this here, right? Mm. Yes, go ahead. Uh, is it possible that only crack selling uh, might extend the life for maybe four years? No. No, that's not reasonable because it, it, uh, you need to understand the nature of the phenomena. When you do yeah, crack sealing, the, just maybe in, in a place uh, with uh, frosty temperature or freezing freezing temp temperature, uh, a crack might uh, be very dangerous for pavement. Yeah, no, because... the crack is not good. I agree, but you need to mm -hmm. think of the nature of the crack. The crack will arrive uh, by temperature curling uh, of the pavement. When you go and do the sealing of that crack, mm -hmm. the next year, most likely you will have new cracks. Of course. And then it's not reasonable to think that a crack sealing will give you more than one, maybe two years in the best case. Okay. But if you do a Milan overlay, Milan overlay is because you are replacing the top portion of the asphalt. The one that mm -hmm. is cracked with rotting. It took eight years to arrive into that. So we expect that the Milan overlay will be effective eight years. You see? Mm -hmm. If we know the life of the pavement with no interventions, we just build it new and let it deteriorate until we have to do reconstruction. It's 25 years because that's the design life. Mm -hmm. Then we expect a full reconstruction to bring it back to new, a partial reconstruction to maybe give me a little less, maybe 15 years instead of 20. So we need to understand what is the nature of the uh, treatment we are doing and the nature of the, uh, how fast is deteriorating. This is why, again, we need to know this performance curve, if it is deteriorating very fast or not. Uh, professor? Yes, go ahead. Oh, okay, someone else was also asking. Um, might have asked this question um, before, but uh, just wondering. So is there, is there a sort of like a guideline as in which treatment would give us roughly how many years of yes. new, new pavement? I mean, does that depend on location to location? No, no, yes, yes and no, but there's a rough guideline for that. Okay, okay. Um, I just don't know if that is uh, part of the topic I'm supposed to cover today. Just give me 10 seconds to make sure I have to cover that or not. Um, yes, applicability. Is here. So, for pavements, uh, sorry, uh, maybe I, let me just uh, let me just make sure that there's nothing else in information that I need to tell you. Uh, no, that's fine. That's just a representation of that. Don't say it. 
Uh, for pavements, uh, let me see where can I do that, uh, maybe here. Although I have a file, just a second, please. Ah, here. So we have this as general, there are more, right? You have had in place recycled. And they're older, but these are the main ones. You have crack ceiling. Uh, everybody's clear what is crack ceiling? Crack ceiling means the pavement is relatively new. Uh, the pavement doesn't have major rotting or permanent deformations are very little, almost unnoticeable. And uh, the pavement is very, very, very new, has some cracks and uh, you go with uh, asphalt binder, liquid asphalt binder and you seal the cracks. You clean the crack a little bit and, and then uh, you apply this uh, liquid uh, uh, substance uh, like a seal coat or something like that in the crack to seal it. Microsurfacing means there is some permanent deformation on the pavement that is less than half an inch or 13 millimeters, well 12.7 millimeters. And uh, you can go with a paver machine, a special one that is called microsurfacing paver and you can put a very skinny layer of uh, hot mix asphalt uh, of half an inch and this is gonna rectify your rutting, the rutting on the wheel paths of the trucks. Milan overlay means you have damage in the form of uh, permanent deformation on the wheel paths of the trucks and you have cracks Sometimes you even have block cracks or alligator cracks, uh, but they just appear. They are very recent. Uh, no part of the asphalt cement has popped out. Uh, you just see the cracks over there and you see the ruts. And so, but you know the depth of those is less than the thickness of the asphalt layer. So if your asphalt layer is say, um, uh, 15 centimeters, you know that the damage is extending maybe uh, down to uh, three centimeters or maybe five centimeters, but it's less. So you can go out of this 15, you can keep 10 and you can put a, a, a new layer. So you remove and replace the top five or maybe top seven centimeters. It's up to you. It depends on how uh, extensive is the damage, but you don't replace fully the 15 centimeters or whatever thickness you have. That is your Milan overlay. Now the partial reconstruction means you have to fully take away the hot mix asphalt layer. It's gone completely. And you have to go and do some recompaction on the granular layers Maybe you need to put again uh, some treatments for the subgrade soil, uh, but you can save the granular layer. You put new hot mix asphalt and that is called partial reconstruction. And full reconstruction, you need to rip everything apart. You need to remove the hot mix asphalt, the base, the sub base, and put everything back again. Now, these are the rules that Cameron was asking for. The, the crack ceiling, we need very little rutting. Uh, typically, we will think less of three millimeters. This is in millimeters. And you need cracking, uh, maybe, in, see, we can probably arrive to the 20% here, but we don't really want to push the envelope that far. So this is in percentage cracking. So 10% is probably a reasonable amount. 
uh, some agencies might be tolerant and might let it go to a little more. Uh, for microsurfacing, we need to be bef below 30 millimeters. We cannot have more than that. Because if you have more than 30 millimeters, the machine we use cannot correct it. You will do the, the treatment and you will still see the wheel path deformations. We can have some cracking, like here I could tolerate maybe the 10% if I want. In Milan overlay, I have more than 13 millimeters of rotting. So the microsurfacing cannot correct it. And I have significant cracking, Ali. Excuse me, uh, patching is a kind of Milan overlay or not? Patching. Patching are two types. You have uh, non-structural patching <laughs> and you have a structural. The structural patching is similar to a reconstruction. Yes. The non-structural patching uh, is similar to a Milan overlay somehow. <laughs> It's not beyond the asphalt. No. Uh, it could arrive to be the partial reconstruction. Yes. But the problem with this patching is that you have significant amount of cracks that are making pop out uh, portions of the hot mix asphalt layer. They're popping out. And when they pop, expose the granular. Uh, base. So you need to cut a square or rectangular portion and make sure that you are recompacting uh, and replacing with the same thickness of the existing materials. Because if you put uh, more in thickness, the patching itself will be stronger and will not get along with the surrounding material. If you put skinnier, it's gonna produce the same. So it has to be done carefully. Okay. Uh, so I was saying for Milan overlay, you need more than 13 millimeters in rotting or, and cracking is 10%, up to 10%. So when we say percent, uh, 20, 20 percent, pardon. Yes, Cameron. Yeah. So when we say percent, it's I mean we are calculating percentage area of the cracking. I mean the the damaged pavement or uh, how are we estimating this? Uh, they have two percentage? types. They have one type that is the percentage on the wheel path, and they have a percentage that is general on the entire lane. This is lane percentage. Lane percentage. Okay. But they also have wheel path percentage okay which i'm not talking about now because for that yeah. one is it, is similar the story but let's think it's lane percentage okay now partial reconstruction means something wrong is with the structure and for that we need an indicator of the structure We could have used the structural number if you want. The problem is if we know how to measure that structural number with machines, when we go and do data collection on the field, and we don't have anything to do that. So this is why typically we rely on deflectometers. Okay. But in the partial in the partial reconstruction, if we have issues with the structured work, we are only replacing the asphalt layer. Uh, why aren't we going down to another oh, layer? The partial the... reconstruction could also affect uh, the granular layer. Okay. It is uh, is borderline. Maybe okay. that's the answer. So okay. if this is no, sorry, Cameron, you're absolutely right. 
And the partial reconstruction is only the top layer. That's why the strength is more than 18. Sorry, you are correct, Ron. You are correct. Okay. Thank you. The full reconstruction is the one that is weak. And we need to go and do that reconstruction. You see, there are more than one partial reconstruction. There's one reconstruction that is the hot mix asphalt and, 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 and some amount of works on the granular. But the one I prefer to handle is only the hot mix asphalt to, to, to be involved. And in here you have all layers. Now, if you follow these rules, you can match this to a number of years for rotting, right? So you could have here rotting in years and you can have cracking in years and you can have a deflection basin area in years, right? And then you can have a range and then you can say for cracking, uh, years will be between one and five, maybe three. Uh, no, rotting, sorry. Uh, for in terms of cracking for microsurfacing, maybe it's from years uh, three to seven. I don't know. It depends on the performance curve, you see? So at the end of the day, this crack area that we have here in the performance curve is very important because it's going to tell me, for instance, in five years, I reach almost 20% crack area. It's very fast. And I need another one for rotting. So this is my rotting. So uh, this is the equation that characterizes my rotting. So in 10 years, my rotting is 25 millimeters and I want less than 13. So I risk 13 millimeters, in this case, almost by year four and a half. It's also quite fast. And I need the deflection basin area. So I need to create these independent performance curves. I need to know what is the treatment effectiveness, which I closed the Excel. Sorry guys, I closed the Excel. And I need to know what is the timing for the treatments in terms of years. So for that example we saw before is even more uh, strict than this. You realize that by year five, I already reached uh, almost my 20%, right? So my 20% is here, up to 20, right? So that's my cracking and in rotting, my 13 millimeters is 4.5. So I need to read that back from my performance curves. Uh, and for deflection basin, we say 18. My 18 is on year uh, probably 11, getting close to 12. This is 20, this is 15. So it's here. Year 11, 11 and a half is my DBA 18. So this 18 is uh, year 11.5. So for these ones doesn't matter because they are not conditioned by this. I need to know when is my 10% for cracking. My 10% cracking will be on year Four probably. And I need to do the same for rotting. So for rotting, I need to be on a 3% rotting. So what is 3% rotting? Probably here, so it's year one. After one year, I will get there. Now, it depends on the performance curve, of course.
So I can put some rules in the amount of time. Uh, no, that's the material for the next class actually. And of course I have equations uh, that will characterize uh, the DBA, the ratting. So I know the equation, right? So actually I can come here and see uh, the numbers. Or with the equation, I can estimate the exact number. So at the end of the day, these metrics with these years, if I know that after year four or year five, I have a specific type of treatment, then I know that after this point on time, after year five, uh, chances are I have Milan overlay or something heavier than that. But again, I need to establish one of these per indicator. So I need to have one of these for cracking. I need to have one of these for rutting. And I need to have one of these for deflection basin area from FWD. If you have roughness, you need one of these for roughness. If you have PCI, you need one of these for PCI. Okay? Uh, in this case, was corrosion. But it's going to be for the indicator you have. Okay, guys, I'm out of time. So if you have questions, please go ahead. Excuse me. Yes. I, I have a request and a suggestion. Okay. Uh, is it possible to postpone the exam for the week after? Because...